Good morning and welcome to the launch webinar for Construction Scotland Innovation Centre's 12-month programme on diversity and inclusion, Dive In. During this series of webinars and training sessions, we aim to raise awareness of key quality diversity and inclusion issues, provide the tools that can be used to stimulate positive and progressive practice, and to strengthen our community of practitioners, leaders, and change makers within the construction industry. Welcome to the first step in this journey. I very much look forward to engaging with you over the coming months. Um, I'm Douglas Morrison. I'm the Director of Operations and Future Skills at Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. Um, and we are the National Innovation Centre for the Built Environment. Um, we aim to connect our industry and academic communities to collaborate on work that ultimately delivers a cleaner, safer and more productive construction industry and built environment. If you want to find out more or get in touch, you can find us at www.ts-ic.org. I'm joined today by a panel who will offer fascinating insights into their personal experiences of advancing, embracing, and benefiting from diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And we have Amanda McKay, who's a Quality and Assurance Director of Alpha VT Vinci. Um, and Amanda will be sharing her lived experience and what needs to change within the industry. We'll hear from Emily Carr, who's an architect design manager with Keir Construction. Um, and Emily will be sharing her experiences as an early career professional. Um, and lastly, we'll be joined by Michael Divers, the People Director with Sir Robert McAlpine. And Michael will be sharing um, his, his experience of engaging effectively in a mass cultural transformation programme. Before we do get started, there are just a few points that I want to cover. Um, firstly, to ask a question, you can click on the questions tab in the control panel. And type in your questions, press send. We will try to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session. And there will also be a series of poll questions coming through. And so please do respond to them. And they're really useful ways for us to, to gauge um, your thinking. Um, and we will report back on the results of each poll as we progress through it. More generally, your feedback is extremely valuable, so we'll take all questions or comments on board. Even if we don't have time to answer them all today, uh, we will certainly seek to do so um, soon thereafter. Um, and lastly, we are ably assisted today by our colleague Danielle. who will be able to respond to any technical issues that, um, that you may have if you post them into the chat box. So without further ado, we're going to start off with our very first poll of the day. Um, so it should appear on your screen just momentarily. Um, and our first question is asking to what extent have the events of the last 12 months impacted on the commitment to diversity and inclusion within your organisation? And um, we have four choices. Um, have you enhanced your commitment to diversity and inclusion? Um, has that commitment remained unchanged? Um, has it been deprioritised um, in, you know, in pursuit of higher priority um, agendas? Um, or, or do you not know um, or, or aren't able to make um, any clear choice at this time? Um, we'll leave it open for just another few seconds. And we should be closing the poll down any moment now and we'll have a look at those results. Um, so what, what we see is that um, we're pos positively surprising for, for most of you. Um, there's either been a, an enhancement um, or, a, or a status quo. Um, we do have a few who have deprioritised, but I think that's that, that's a pretty positive message coming through and um, to see just just over a third um, of organisations represented have um, have enhanced their commitment. Um, so we are now going to hand over to, to our first contributor today, um, Amanda McKay, um, again working with uh, Balfour Vitae Vinci. Um, and Amanda should be appearing on your screen momentarily to share her lived experience in the construction industry and to explore what still needs to change. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you very much, Douglas. And um, hopefully you can see my, my opening uh, slide there. Um, I'm Amanda Mackay. I'm the Quality and Assurance Director with Balfour Beatty Vonshi. Um, I joined the HS2 project um, last year in July. Uh, this is a, one of our wonderful uh, comms teams presentation slides that uh, I'm opening up the a, um, presentation today with. And what I'm going to do is give you a bit of uh, my experience as um, somebody who is uh, who transitioned late in life, having worked in the construction industry, and 
my sort of overview of what's happened in the last sort of 30, 35 years. Oops. So a little bit about me, uh, Yorkshire by birth, Glaswegian by adoption. I've been up here in Glasgow now over 10 years uh, and love living in the city. Uh, my early career was in mining and tunneling. I'm a, a mine engineer by uh, by degree and um, joined the mining industry in 1984, which wasn't a good year for, for coal mining. And move my skills into construction and I've worked in many sectors in my career um, both in nuclear oil and gas uh, nuclear being probably where I spent a great deal of my time uh, I was uh, my last project was down at Hinkley C uh, on the um, the construction of the water cooling system uh, and I've spent a lot of my time in Sellafield and places like Dune Ray and Sizewell um, Always been an active volunteer in my life. Um, I was a TA officer in my early years and a special constable for 21 years. And when I started my transition, I started to focus my time on LGBT charities up here in Scotland. Um, I was trustee on a number of charities up here, but I also work with my professional body and also now with Building Equality, who are uh, an LGBT plus na nationwide uh, construction group. And a few little pictures there of me through the years. Um, I use the, the last picture up in the top corner. It's the last picture of Martin, uh, my former self. Uh, my last day of service with Cumbria Constabulary as Chief Officer. And that was my presentation, my certificate of service. So that's the last ever photo of Martin. So my experience in construction. Um, the construction sector certainly changed a lot in the last 35 years. and and particularly for those who are not white, male and heterosexual, or as I like to say, male, pale and stale. Um, I, when I joined construction in about 1985-86, the vast majority of the industry uh, was white male. Um, the workforce was quite transitory. The conditions from health and safety through to mental health, just to even the canteen facilities and toilets and things were absolutely appalling. But people put up with it because that was the nature of the industry at that time. I've known for many, many years that I was trans um, and I started my journey in my 20s and realised that the industry that I was in, I was just never going to work. And I love the work that I do and the, and the sectors that I've worked in. So to me, I put my career first and because I one, I enjoyed it. Two, I needed to earn money. And I realized that coming out as uh, trans at, at the age of 22 in that sector was not really going to work for me. And it wasn't really until the late 2000s I encountered very few minorities in construction. And the culture really wasn't very good. And, and you know, uh, for those of us who are a little older, you know, site banter was something that was. Um, you listen to you put up with and you know dare i say i even engaged in in some occasions uh, it wasn't very um inclusive it certainly wasn't very friendly towards minority groups and i can remember a particular conversation about um a trans woman when i was in my mid-20s uh and this was a documentary television that was on uh the bbc about somebody who transitioned and the conversation in the um, office the following day was quite appalling. And if it was today, people would be leaving the organization under a cloud. There were very few role models to, um, to learn from and refer to. And I think that's still important because I don't see a great many role models still today. And one of the things that did disturb me a little bit and was a great deal of bullying and corporate inaction when dis you know, discrimination took place. The image of construction back then was incredibly poor and backward. One of the reasons that I moved into oil and gas, partly because of a career progression, but partly because I saw them as being a little bit more advanced. Um, there were more minorities, and uh, certainly a lot more women in the sector um, than they were in mainstream construction. And when I came out, I found that the, many were quite accepting 
Uh, I came out in, in 2013. I was working for Scott and uh, Energy up here in Glasgow, um, managing, um, I was head of quality for their major projects business. So we were building assets all over. And I suppose as a client, um, most of the people I interacted with within the construction industry were my supply chain. But I still found them very accepting. And one of the reasons I came to Balfour Beatty is that Balfour's were one of my um, suppliers and I found them particularly accepting and um, very forward thinking in some of their uh, diversity and inclusion practices. And this was back in um, about 2012, 2013, when I was coming out. Um, I really found a mixed reception on site. And I have to say, you know, if I hadn't got a resilient mindset and the level of self-confidence, I think it would be very difficult. And if, um, you know, it had been one of my junior members of my my team who come out, I think they might have found it a little difficult um, to survive on, on the site back in, you know, the uh, sort of 2012, 2013. Um, I'm a fairly resilient person. I spent a lot of time with the policing and having insults hurled at you on a daily basis or comments made was, um, I have to say, uh, par for the course and still is if you're in uh, law enforcement. Um, there was very little DNI education beyond staff towards site operatives. And that's something that um, I still find today. If you haven't got an email address, you're generally left out of the DNI conversation. Uh, when it comes to sites and projects and that's an area i think as an industry we definitely need to address um, and i found as time went on there was a great understanding of diversity and inclusion and its impact on the workforce uh, linked with mental health i know for myself um, coming out was a was a big burden lifted off me um, it allowed me to be myself at work and it allowed me to, to progress and i think my career has progressed certainly a lot faster since i came out because I'm not hiding that little guilty secret and being in the closet anymore. And I feel confident to be able to not only speak publicly about it, but also internally and with, with my colleagues and with my supply chain. I make no, you know, no bones about the fact that I'm trans. Um, and for me, I find that honest and authentic view actually helps me to be able to get on at work, um, particularly in this industry. And one of the things I found originally is a lot more role models, a lot more visibility of minorities in the sector. And it does feel a much more inclusive place to work in. Having said that, I still think we have a lot more to do. So what really needs to change? Well, we need to include everybody in that ED and I agenda. And as I said uh, a few minutes ago, if you don't have a corporate email, you're very rarely included. And I know within my, you know, the project I'm working on now, I'm working on a little side project, uh, how do we get equality, diversity and inclusion agenda right the way down to every person on that project, be it the, the people who clean our offices, our security guards, the guys who operate our plant and machinery, you know, the steel fixers, everybody. It's not just, uh, EDNI is not just the domain of those with an email address. It needs to be for everybody. I think greater visibility of role models across the sector, so potential new entrants and existing employees see a more diverse industry. We have a skill shortage. It's going to get worse. Uh, we're struggling now to recruit, on, I know, in, in my own project. Um, and we need to make this industry attractive to people. They need to see that they have a valid career and they'll be treated with respect and treated uh, uh, will will gain promotion on based upon their merit and ability, not on who they are or their background. And senior leaders need to be actively engaged in EDI initiatives. And one of the things we do in Balfour Beatty is reverse mentoring uh, with senior leaders as uh, mentees and members of our affinity networks and minorities acting as mentors. And it does help them to gain a greater empathy, that lived experience of others and, and what the differences are. And, and I mean, one of the things that our, our CEO gained, we, we had. Um, one of his mentors was a, a young lady from the um, BAME community um, and she told him exactly what it was like to be a young female and black working in the construction sector. And I think it was a real eye opener for him. We need to change the way that we work to be more attractive to those who want flexible working. 
Um, I think COVID has actually helped that. My own organisations recognised that going forward, um, you don't have to be in the office five days a week, nine till five, to be productive and, um, you know, um, effective member of staff. And even those who are working on my project, about 70% of us don't need to be on site. So we're not on site. We're working from home at the moment. And that needs to continue post-COVID because we have a lot of good people who would join the industry but don't see it as flexible enough in the way that we operate. We do need greater support for minorities in the workplace, including mentors and buddies. Um, it's a, something that we've been doing in Balfour BT for a little while with, with new people if they want it. That support's available for them. Um, helping them to get around, a, a particularly on a new project, um, particularly younger people, and graduates, apprentices and trainees. Um, it can be quite daunting joining the world of work. And if you're a little different from everybody else, that can be even worse. So uh, we have that support there um, to get people up and running and to gain their confidence. And we need more people to step forward as allies to the to these wider um, groups of people and a greater awareness within construction of the effects of poor diversity and inclusion. We know that we have a high suicide rate in this industry. That's really good uh, to see that the industry is actually buying into it now. Mental health education and mental health first data has certainly improved um, the parts of the organisation I work for and people are much feel much more comfortable at being more open about talking about the issues. Um, we need to do a lot more of that around other areas as well. And I'll just leave you with a few um, things about how the construction industry is doing. So 20% of people experience verbal abuse regarding their sexual orientation and gender identity within construction. And they, these come from a construction news survey. It's a couple of years old, but I suspect it hasn't changed a great deal. Um, I feel working in engineering had a, sorry, 29% felt working in engineering construction had a negative effect on their mental health. Um, that's pressures of work. That's the way that we work. Sometimes that's the banter that goes on in uh, offices and on the work site. That needs to change. 59% do not feel comfortable being open about their gender identity or sexual orientation on site. And I would say these are, um, steered towards an LGBT plus survey, by the way. Um, I think it's really important. Bringing your whole self to work and being your authentic self is really important. If you don't have to worry about people worrying whether you're gay or whether you're trans or, or whatever else, you will be a far more effective employee and certainly be a lot happier at work. And finally, 30% feel being LGBT is a barrier to career progression. Um, the last few years, I've been lucky to be included in the top 100 list of LGBT executives across the world. Um, I'm the only one in construction, which says a lot. Um, I know of one or two others who are in construction but are not openly LGBT uh, because they fear it will harm their career progression and their job. So. We need to have an industry where it's acceptable to be who you are and to be your authentic self and not to be judged because your sexuality, your your colour, your ability, your family situation uh, makes you slightly different to uh, the others. And construction is no longer the domain of the male, pale and stale. Moving forward, it will be a, a sort of a multicultural, multi-ethnic um, very diverse industry because we have a skill shortage and we need more people to choose construction as a career. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Amanda. And what, um, what, what a fascinating insight, a, an incredible experience um, and so much for us to learn from. I have no doubt our audience have many questions um, for you in our Q&A session. Um, we are we are going to um, hand over now to, uh, to Emily Carr. Uh, Emily is going to share um, her perspectives as a, an early career professional. Um, Emily works as an architect and design manager with Care Construction um, and should be coming on to your screen momentarily.
There we go. Right. Um, you just have to bear with me one second. I just want to share my screen. Um, Right, there we are. So, um, <laughs> apologies for that technical uh, blip. Uh, so, uh, my name is Emily Carr. I'm I'm an architect. Um, I qualified um, as an architect about five years ago, um, and recently I've been working as a design manager, and I'm due to start with uh, Keir actually tomorrow. Um, my career um, experience of construction so far has been a varied one. I've been very fortunate um, enough to to work on some of the most uh, presti prestigious um, private projects um, in London, um, and but but I also was able to um, go to Nepal and um, I carried out some um, volunteer work initially, um, doing manual labour for um, an American NGO. Um, after the 2015 earthquakes, but then um, ended up working on um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, that's Changu Narayan, and um, worked for um, the NGO Architecture Sans Frontières um, on a collaborative uh, community uh, rebuild, um, also following the earthquakes. Um, one of the things that um, we did while we were out there was that we looked at um, training and we looked at local empowerment. Um, and we also looked at um, sort of delegating um, responsibilities and roles um, back to the community, uh, whether through the um, UNESCO restoration project um, or um, at ASF, um, our collaborative rebuild. Um, and that was via um, a women's committee in both both projects, um, setting them up. Um, and one both projects looked at offering a specialised yet local construction and maintenance training um, because there was a, an identified loss of um, both the intangible and tangible heritage um, not only just the buildings but also the craftsmanships um, and the idea of um, the um, historical buildings and vernacular buildings um, were deemed unsta unstable. Um, then when I um, came back to the UK and started working in, in London again, um, I moved across to a company called Size Group um, who work on um, high-end private projects, um, uh, uh, private residential buildings in London, um, and was very fortunate enough to, to take on the role of design manager. Um, and while I was doing that, my experience of working um, with people um, in Nepal um, and empowering um, marginalized stakeholders sort of came back into play when I sort of realized that um, I was the only design manager who was female on site. Um, one of very few people, a um, <clears throat> few women who were actually not in, in the office. Um, and um, even though the company was um, very much um, uh, wanted to empower young people, it sort of, I brought home what I had, I had learnt while in Nepal, that actually you, you needed to um, empower every single voice. And that um, indeed my, my voice counted too. Um, so I started to sort of um, uh, carry out um, Sort of colloquial research um, and just wanted to become more involved in diversity and inclusion. Um, and um, last year, or 2019 actually, um, I applied for the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, um, a fellowship that I was awarded at the beginning of 2020, looking to, um, to go to Sweden to investigate ongoing initiatives over there, promoting women in, in construction. Um, and that was on a follow on of their um, a government initiative to um, promote the numbers and increase the numbers. Um, and so, as Amanda very well um, has already said, there is a well identified long standing um, age and skills gap in the sector. Um, and I also agree that um, COVID um, is actually, um, you know, has exacerbated existing conditions um, and existing problems. Um, leading to, you know, both flexible working being um, sort of incorporated and encouraged, but then also longer working hours um, to having to take place due to, you know, restrictions on site and um, procurement times taking much longer. So it seems to be that um, um, 
what what I've been learning and the the people I've been speaking to that um, diversity and inclusion is uh, very much um, at the front of people's minds, but at the same time, um, the sort of the restrictions of COVID has um, created both barriers and gateways for for different people. Um, as it says on that slide, um, you know, it's women make up at the moment only 14% of the current workforce, um, with only 2% um, on site, including myself, and um, even less of 1% of um, uh, women in the trades. So um, while I was working in London, um, I became part of an online initiative um, called the New Faces of Women in Construction, where um, we had a number of people um, had their portraits taken just to slowly start to change the, the face of construction that seems to be still quite a, um, a dominated, um, male dominated and, and somewhat toxic work environment. Um, just um, because uh, what I've learned and, and from um, my, my ongoing blog, um, which I'll post with you in a minute, is that it's um, diversity and inclusion and equality are, um, are issues and and items that need to be addressed but need to be addressed as they are forever evolving and we need to keep learning um, as um, Amanda rightfully said from and I have an understanding that um, it is different for different people. What I've learned from um, this last year of um, not being able to go to Sweden and um, sort of somewhat struggling to find um, work and therefore um, networking like Matt is that it is um, <laughs> It is a difficult time and um, diversity and inclusion has somewhat um, been shifted from everybody's mind. But so many people have said to me that COVID is the catalyst for real systemic change. But I agree with what Amanda said, it, it has to be on multiple fronts. We need a top-down attitude um, in management um, as well as um, encouraging um, new people um, and people like me in our early career to um, believe that our voices are just as important um, and to enable diversity and inclusion to not be just tokenistic. <clears throat> um, we also need to um, embrace different methods of construction and different ways of building. Um, this I feel more and more even though my background is in conservation, um, I think that um, all of us having to embrace technology over the last year and work very differently, um, I think is a very, it, it's great. It's, it should be seen as an asset because it enables different types of people to come into this sector. And what we really need right now is collaboration to learn from different people and address this skills and age gap. And I think also from the people I've been um, learning from, I think there needs to be an understanding that systemic change does take time. It's not a one fix, you know, um, one trick pony that one fix will, will do the trick. Um, and I think that um, where some of the solution lies is empowering young people. Um, we need to um, let them know and um, really let them feel that they are an asset. Um, and I also feel like we need to not forget the current workforce too. Um, but ultimately, um, diversity and inclusion should be seen as part of the business case, um, working policy and identity of the company um, to really sort of make its mark. Um, and then finally, um, I just wanted to put in um, that I've been working on a, a sort of a colloquial ongoing blog um, about sharing people's stories of the gateways and barriers that people have faced um, over the various lockdowns now. Um, and I was just interested if anyone wants to share their story about what they have been going through, um, it will help because we need to learn from each other and we need to keep learning because I don't believe it's good enough to just build back better. We need to build back equal. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Emily. I think that's a, a wonderful message to, to close on. Um, build Back Equal certainly resonates with um, with, with our speakers and, and I'm sure our audience. Um, we are now going to move on to, to our third and final speaker. Um, we're joined by Michael Divers, 
um, from Sir Robert McAlpine, and um, Michael is going to be sharing details um, about how to engage um, with, with a mass culture change um, transformation program. Um, so over to you, Michael. Michael, sorry, you're still on mute. You could just unmute, thanks. Is that okay? Okay. Can you hear me yeah. now? Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, apologies for that. Uh, Amanda uh, described herself as proudly living in Glasgow. Uh, I'm a proud Glaswegian living living in London, uh, and I have done so for the past um, 20, 20 odd years, uh, which dates me actually. Um, I'm proud to be the the people director for Sir McAlpine Limited. Uh, and let me talk to you a little bit about change and transformation uh, in organisations. Um, the, the first thing I'm going to say is that the word transformation tends to leave people incredibly cold. And most people think it's something that's done to them uh, and people become very resistant. And the one thing I've learned in Sarah McAlpine is that you really have to go with the flow of the business. So the worst thing that I could do in joining this company is to come in and impose change and transformation into, into our organisation. Um, the, the two people I see on that image, um, the, the person to the right is Karen Brooks. She's my boss. She's our board director for people and infrastructure. And she, she was the, the first woman to join Sir McAlpine's board. She's recently been joined by uh, Alison Cox as our director of engineering. Now, beside her is Kate, Dr. Kate McAlpine. Uh, Kate uh, does work with our uh, female to, uh, women development program. So she works with uh, a number of our uh, women managers in the business on their development uh, as part of our mentoring work with them. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know, Sir Roman Calpine is in its 152nd year. Uh, I'm not 152, uh, although <laughs> with the current pandemic, I think I feel that way. Now, we're an iconic brand and synonymous with some phenomenal structures that have been built over the years. Um, we're a family owned business, um, and I didn't really get what that meant until I joined Sir Robert McAlpine. Now, when you're sitting across from your chairman, his surname is McAlpine, Ed McAlpine, you realise that this is their business, and the word family permeates through everything that we do. Um, we're a family, we look after each other, our people on sites are part of that family. Uh, you know, in, in thinking about this, what I was going to say today, um, in many ways, I'm the least important person in our business. The people who are important are the people who are on our sites up and down the country delivering phenomenal structures for uh, our clients. Now, our values underpin everything that we do. Uh, those were developed by our people uh, prior to me joining. And uh, as a business, we're committed to being inclusive and diverse. And listen, it's a journey that we're on. And when people say, you know, we're committed to being inclusive and diverse, my, my tendency is to say, well, what's the evidence that you're doing that? Um, for a number of years now, we've been a, a sponsor for Women in Construction. Our, our chairman, Michael Plain, spoke at the last event in London. Uh, we have mentoring programs for female employees. Uh, we have a number of affinity groups across the business looking at um, what we can be doing to be more inclusive from the bottom up. So those groups look at age and gender and ethnicity. So there are seven of those. Um, we have employee reps. Uh, we're now moving to elected employee reps to help us develop our business to engage with our people, those elections are underway. I was delighted yesterday to hear we had over 50 nominees for um, reps. 
uh, and will be uh, new elected reps will be in place from next month. Uh, what, one of the, the first things we were I was asked to do uh, join was to look at our reward systems. And from an HR perspective, the reward tends to be the spinal column. You know, everything links back to how you reward and recognize your people. And in many cases, um, people like me join organizations and we rather piously tell the business what it should have. Uh, and that tends to presume that everybody is the same, one size fits all. Uh, and the Caliban way of addressing that is to ask our people what they needed for their, themselves and for their families. And so the, the, the framework we now have in place was co created with our people, uh, recognizing a number of things. Recognizing that one, people wanted to be fairly paid and like the market, that's fair enough. But the two things uh, that people specifically asked for was uh, they wanted more time for themselves and their families, and they wanted their families to benefit from working here. So the construction of our employee benefits has now been designed to represent and to reflect what people need in their lives. Um, in terms of culture change and transformation, um, in many ways, I think how you go about it is, is, is as important as what you want to achieve. And so often, I've either led or been subjected to horrific transformation programs that are very alien. Um, in many cases, people are coming in and imposing things using a language that you would never use. Um, and and people, people, uh, making people feel really uh, uncomfortable and unsure about the future. So I think keeping it clear, keeping it simple, being absolutely honest and transparent about what you're doing, uh, train, reassure, uh, encourage conversations. Um, when we were developing our uh, reward and recognition framework, Business. Uh, we run, I run uh, sessions up and down the country asking people what they wanted. And my job wasn't to pontificate, but it was to listen and to make sure that what, what they said, what people said, was heard and reflected in what we were creating. It's often said that, particularly many middle managers who are not on board with change and transformation, become the barrier. So it's important to make sure that you engage at all levels of the business. People need to be empowered, and knowledge needs to be shared, and information easily accessed. Access. The more clock and dagger you have our knowledge and information, the more suspicious people will become. So in terms of the key learnings, um, think through the pace of what you do and plan accordingly. Um, my chief executive very uh, wisely uh, told me to extend our program on reward and recognition in the business because he wanted us to go really deep into the conversation, not to have superficial conversations, but to do it really, really deeply. Uh, to make it social, now, that's incredibly difficult just now with the pandemic. But nothing for me beats getting people in a conversation around a subject. You can do that virtually, it's better doing it in a room. But that social engagement around the topic is really important. Uh, reinforce what you hear and what you are saying, and recognize people's contributions. And finally, um, whatever you think you need to do in terms of engagement, at least multiply by three, because the more engagement, the, 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 there's a direct correlation between engagement and whatever you're doing, landing successfully. So over engage, you can never engage too much. That's me, uh, words, words of wisdom from uh, 
the people throughout the Australia Cup. I thank you for listening, and, and importantly, uh, Stacey, thank you. No, th thank you, Michael. And you know, again, I think that you know the emphasis on the need to engage, um, you know, with with your colleagues, with with the team, um, and and indeed right across the industries is critically important. Um, and we are now going to engage with our audience again with uh, with our second poll of the day, uh, which should come up on your screen momentarily. Um, so we're asking here to to pick out the statement that best describes your organisation. Um, so is your organisation doing everything it can to realise a diverse and inclusive workplace? Um, does it understand the importance but still has work to do and a, and a long way to go? Um, or does it not do it enough? Um, to support a diverse and inclusive workplace. Um, so we'll leave this open for just another few moments and we will close it down and you should hopefully see. Um, yep, yeah. so again, we, we have a, a fairly decent spread. Um, clearly, a lot of work still, still to be done, um, but really, really heartening to see that almost a third um, of businesses um, represented in our audience are, are, are doing a good job and, and you know, Let's here's hoping that we can push um, those purple and green bars a little bit further up over the course of next year. Um, I am going to ask our panel now to step in and rejoin us. Um, we have some questions um, coming in from our audience. Um, before we get into them, just like to thank you all again um, for your contributions. Real, really fascinating insights um, and looking forward to, to hearing more. Um, the first question that we've had coming in um, is for Amanda. Um, and uh, this question, Amanda, do you feel that young people are also at more of a risk of discrimination and this may prevent them from entering the industry? Um, also, do you feel that clients and consultants are more accepting than the rough and ready world of contracting? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think that having employed a lot of apprentices and trainees and graduates in the last five years um, I do find that there is a bit of a reluctance to want to join an industry which they feel might be less understanding of their needs and more discriminating you know I, I know from my early days of joining in construction the, you know, even as a graduate um, you were subjected to all manner of uh, banter and um, the usual tricks that trainees and apprentices got subjected to. I don't see as much of that now, I have to say. One, from a health and safety perspective, that things that used to go on are just downright dangerous. But I do feel that they there's a, there's a perception there sometimes that younger people won't get a, a fair and equal treatment. Um, I think it's, it's patchy. Uh, projects that I've worked on, particularly the big projects like HS2, they would be more than welcome. They get a really good experience. If they're joining a smaller project, which might be a little regional construction job, where there's they might be the only young person in amongst a, a whole group of experienced people, it will be a different environment. And I do think we have a lot of work to do around that. One, to dispel some of the myths, but also to educate people that you know this is the future of our industry. We need to make sure that they're welcomed uh, when they join because we none of us know everything when we join it doesn't matter how much education you've had or practical training you will all be always be on a learning curve you know I joined this project in in July my most junior member of staff knows more about the intricacies of the management system on this project than I do as quality director so we're all learning um, and what, what was the second part again um, so the, the second part was was just asking whether you feel that clients and consultants are more accepting yeah. than uh, than the, the more general world of contracting. Uh, I think that probably goes back to my my comment about if you've got an email address, you're included. And um, the more professional services side of organisations have really good networks around uh, affinity networks and things because they've got a large collection of staff and if I look at Balfour Beatty Affinity Networks they're made up of staff you know they're made up of the professional um, groups within the organization um, contractors don't always have the luxury of being able to do that um, you know they're guys 
may get involved if they see a poster, if they, they're given a briefing on. Uh, we, we give um, ED&I toolbox talks to the workforce. You know, they're not to the depth that staff might see, but you know we actually talk about you know, minding your language and um, not walking by when they see things which are discriminatory. But um, yeah, I, I think mainstream contractors and particularly the medium-sized contractors who don't have um, you know the the depth of um, the sort of staff that companies like Barfa BT and Sir Robert McAlpine will have. You know, we we can drive these programs internally, but a lot of the smaller ones don't. So yeah, I would I would agree. If if you're in a, a white collar side of a business, you probably got more chance of um, being involved with this. But if you're in the trades, uh, blue collar workers and and transitory labour, you're not. And that's some a balance we need to redress. No, thank thank you, Amanda. I think it's a, a major challenge that um, that we have within the industry. But you know, certainly what what I'm hearing there from you is you know humility and empathy really important within the business. Um, alongside that, you know, investment and you know, again going back to Michael's point around engagement, um, yeah. you know, all being those magic ingredients that um, and when they come together can can make a real difference. Michael, I'd like to bring you in here. We have another question from, from our audience, um, and it, it relates to flexible working. Um, so the, que the question, um, working from home has become the norm. Um, however, their, um, our audience member sees that there's still minimal support for part-time and job sharing. Um, can you maybe offer some perspectives as to how Robert McAlpine are supporting flexible and remote workers? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's evident to everyone that the pandemic has made us all think hard about flexible working and, and working remotely. Um, what, one of the joys for me when I'm having these horrific Zoom calls is looking into people's homes, not just so they the, 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 the decor, but you know, to see the kids running around and dogs barking. It gives you an insight into that you know, people aren't just you know a, a job title that they've got life. So it's, it's been a joy to see that. Um, and, and people are working, for those who can, are working flexibly and agilely. My, my concern in respect of mental health for those people who are able to do is um, around their well-being because what I'm hearing is that most of us are working longer. Um, and it's even more pressured. Um, so we're looking at things like, um, you know, between 12 and 2, there should be no meetings, for example, that was suggested by mental health first aiders, and getting managers to, to be more alert to the pressures that working agilely and, and remotely creates. Well, well, one of our concerns is around creating a two-tier business people who can work flexibly and agile and those who can't. And the, the, the thing we've constantly heard since I've joined when we talk about this is it's not possible on the site. The clients won't tolerate it. And so we're looking at setting up a couple of exemplar projects where we, at the very beginning of the project, when we're doing the commercials, are building flexibility and agility into how the into how the project is structured and to use those as internal case studies to evidence the opportunities and the potential barriers for agile and flexible working on site. But I think, you know, if anything, the, the pandemic hasn't done a lot of good things, but one of the, 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 the things it has done is absolutely bring flexibility and agility to the fore. Uh, we don't have many job shares. I would I would love to see job shares coming into the business. I, I was on a call last week to the business, to colleagues in the business. Uh, you know, if two people came forward and, and wanted us to uh, make that happen, we would gladly work with them to do that. Uh, or HR should be more proactive in promoting job share. Uh, I really uh, wistfully said that we could be a bit like solid like a like day, bringing people together for job share arrangements. It wasn't that funny. After no, th thank you, Michael. And you know, I, I think there's some really interesting reflections in there. 
um, you know, we, we do speak about a, you know, a fragmented industry, um, you know, in, in terms of you know, locations and specialisms. But um, I think what, what I'm hearing from both you and Amanda is that you know, there are clear distinctions between those on site areas of industry and, and those, um, those areas that maybe sit in the design process or um, on the professional side. So, uh, again, you know, different solutions for different businesses in, in, in different ways, I suppose, is the, the key message come, coming through here. Um, Emily, in, in your presentation, you, you, know, you spoke about, um, you know, the development of a more diverse workforce um, coming, coming through um, the, the skill system, you know, being, um, being recruited from, uh, from a more diverse talent pool. Uh, we have a, a question here uh, from an audience member that's asking, whether the skill shortage gives an opportunity to hire a more diverse workforce, or, or are these two issues separate? Well, we still can't hear you just, just yet, Emily. So what what we'll do we'll come we'll come back to you, Emily. I'll maybe pause this. Oh, we've got we've got you now. Okay. And have you got you? Sorry. Um, I think my keypad froze. Um, it's because it's a tablet. Um, it's a really, it's a really, it's a really great question. Um, I think I actually think it's two different um problems. I think it's a combination of um. Uh, um, as buildings become more complex, uh, we need more people to kind of deal with um, um, how we manage, um, design, and then deliver um, uh, the, the building itself. Um, I'm, I'm a good example of that because um, a design manager is a relatively new role, and it's it's partly <clears throat> it's partly because buildings are becoming more complex that you need someone on the contractor's side to be able to sort of pick. Um, the, the design apart and then siphon it off to your various subcontractors. Um, so I think it's sort of complexity um, and, and the sort of skill sets that we have people currently on site and, and well into their careers are probably um, used to a different um, system and need to be kind of, I wouldn't say related, but just their, their knowledge expanded. Um, and then I also think that it's, it's sadly, it's still that kind of old school way of doing things that then is applied onto younger individuals um, that you know you have to do it the way that was it was always done and then once you go through all these various initiations and, and whatnot then you're sort of part of the team when in actual fact we should be sort of empowering younger individuals and saying you know what you have the skills um, that I don't have and we need to recognize that as an asset um, and that you know even just in the last year and we've all learned how to use these various sort of webinars and online um, software systems that we had no idea even existed. And and people who are sort of 10 years younger than me are um, have already got all of that knowledge and, and we need to be sort of actually looking to them. And I, I would actually say that it is technology that will be, um, you know, that I think is the skills that we are sort of lacking, um, but we need to kind of pair it up with what was done before so that both people um, sort of early into your careers and then well well progressed both feel empowered rather than one feeling like they are being sort of siphoned off um, with someone new I think it needs to be both people types of people raised up. No, th thank you Emily um, we, we only have time for just a, a couple more um, questions so I'm going to ask for some some very brief responses here this is the the quick fire round robin um, round. So, um, Michael, I'm going to start with you. Um, a question coming in, just asking whether you can identify any skills shortages um, that the industry is facing. I think you're still on mute there, Michael. There we go. But we've still not got you, Michael. Can Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, I, th I think skills are in using technology as well. <laughs> uh, the whole digital agenda is something that uh, we, we are absolutely focused on. 
on planning, commercial skills, project management, uh, some of the core uh, construction disciplines like cladding, for example. Uh, for, for us, um, it's a combination of uh, two, two things. One is looking at our entry programs and bringing in emerging talent to the entry programs. But we also have to be developing our existing people to making sure that their skills are future proof for the sector as well. So it's a combination of both. Oh, th thank you, Michael. Um, ne next question I'm going to pose to Amanda. Uh, Amanda, you referenced industry bodies um, earlier on. Uh, we have a question asking whether they are doing enough um, to train um, your colleagues within the industry to embrace diversity and inclusion, um, and should they be doing more? Um, I, I think some of them have, have really bought into this agenda. One, because we need to attract more people into the sector. Um, I, we've done a piece of work with uh, the ICE. I mean, in, in Scotland, ICE are running a whole load of webinars and, and seminars just around LGBT at the moment because of LGBT History Month. Um, Chartered Industry Institute of Building and, and one or two others have done quite a bit of work in this area. Still a lot more to do. I mean, my own professional body, Chartered Quality Institute, we've only just embraced d and you know, so we, we, we're on a journey with that. But yeah, um, they're a lot better than they were, uh, but still a lot more to do. No, but very, very positive to hear that, that things are moving there, Amanda. Thank you. Um, and then finally, and very briefly, Emily, um, do you think that children seeing their parents working from home is a benefit um, or not in exposing them to the workplace and the wider industry? Um, I, I actually think that is, it is a benefit. Um, so I've, I've had the uh, recent opportunity of working for an architect's practice um, in uh, in Panicook, um, and um, there is a family practice, and uh, their children often would come into the office. And I think it was a really positive way of seeing that working is normal, and that it, it kind of home and life um, and work work life there we go um is all part of um of life and that i think it is it's a good thing to see um and that um you know obviously that was for an architect and it would may well be different for um the construction sector, but i i do believe it is a good, good thing um, and we should promote it and we should support our parents um thank you emily no good good point well made um, we are going to uh, move on to our final, third and final call of the day, um, which should be coming up on your screen momentarily. Um, we are looking for which of the following themes uh, we should incorporate into our dive-in programme over the next 12 months. Um, you can select all that you'd be interested in. Um, so are you interested in supporting a multi-generational workforce and um, promoting gender identity and equal pay, building a culturally diverse workforce, enhancing access and opportunity for disabled workers and exploring neurodiversity and the, the impacts um, within the construction industry. Um, so I'll leave that open for just a few moments. Please do select all that apply and we will share the results of that on your screen now. Um, so building a culturally diverse workforce coming out on top um, but again, really positive to see that a, a broad range of, of support for most most of the, the topics, so around two thirds of our audience or more, um, are, are interested. So we, we will certainly follow up on these. Um, and as I said at the outset, please um, do keep in touch with, with what's coming next. Um, so it, it leaves me to, to wrap up today's session. Um, I'd like to thank our, our panelists for the insights that they've shared. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed hearing from all three of you, um, and indeed um, to thank our audience uh, for coming along this morning and, uh, and, and contributing with, with questions. Uh, I do hope that you enjoyed the session as much as I did. Um, the next two sessions are going to be supported by our partner, Kuwait Scotland, and they'll take place in February. Um, so keep keep your eyes out for, um, for that. Um, these sessions will be um, posted on our website and social media channels. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Equate Scotland, uh, they are the national expert in gender equality throughout the STEM and built environment sector. Um, Equate make a positive difference for women um, by working with education and industry to change workplace culture and ensure that everyone, regardless of their gender, can thrive at work. Um, so again, please do 
um, look out for those sessions. We'd, we'd very much like to have you there. Um, once you receive your feedback form, um, please do take a few minutes to fill it out. Um, it gives us valuable comments that we can use to um, improve our future webinars. And relevant links are provided in the chat box that may interest you, including a link to Building Equality UK and Inter Engineering Support Information. So, thank you once again. Have a wonderful afternoon um, and please do join us for the next sessions. Thank you. <laughs>